Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Vaccine Focus Week. Today, I am so honored to have as my guest, Dr. Jean Dodds. For those of you who have not heard of her, I don't know what rock you've been under, but <laughs> she she owns Hemopet Labs in California. Uh, she has amazing tests and she runs lab work for us. And I just tons of research, tons of research papers, um, and a wealth, wealth of knowledge. Everything I know about uh, thyroid disease, I've learned from this lady right here because <laughs> she's brilliant. So, but we reached out and asked her if she would be willing to do an interview on how vaccines work so that we could actually have pet parents be very educated so that when you go into the veterinary office with your pet and they start spouting information about the 37 vaccinations your Chihuahua needs all at once today, uh, you will be armed with knowledge and information so that you can have an intelligent conversation instead of getting railroaded, cornered, frustrated, uh, or making your veterinarian so mad they won't ever see you again. So <laughs> uh, knowledge is power. So Dr. Dodds was nice enough to send an entire PowerPoint on how vaccines work. So I'm going to turn the screen over to Jean, and she is going to educate us. I may chime in if I see something that makes me go, <gasps> but... Uh, <laughs> So, Jean, thank you very much. Thanks, Judy. Um, yes, so let's start here. So let's look about vaccine issues. 50 years ago, there were very few of us saying that pets were over-vaccinated. Dr. Ron Schultz and I were two of them. We were called irresponsible in public by the profession as well because others were unwilling to consider the idea that vaccines might not always be needed or safe. Gosh, even Imagine today, yeah, I know, even today, only 40% <laughs> of veterinarians are estimated to follow the current World Small Animal Veterinary Association, American Veterinary Medical Association, American Animal Hospital Association, um, Canadian Veterinary Medical Association, and British Veterinary Association vaccine policies. Now, these are policies, they're not regulations. But right, and they, these have changed in the, in the recently. Like yes, the, it used to be recently. It yes. used to be every year and they've actually backed off a little bit. And yet we have 40 percent of the veterinarians who won't even follow the, the new schedule. Yeah, they don't follow the schedule because these except for rabies, these are not regulations. They're only policies. Um, so our pet caregivers, uh, breeders, owners, whatever you want to call us, we don't have to necessarily follow that policy. Because there's no such thing as an up-to-date vaccination or a due vaccination, even if you get a reminder from your veterinary clinic to come in for your vaccination update. Now, just remember, there is nothing due about that. And veterinarians say, well, we have to do that because we can't get clients to come back to see us if we don't remind them about vaccinations. I said, why don't you talk to them about an annual physical examination once a year or twice a year if they're older? And then you can discuss vaccinations and leave the options um, up to the client to decide what to do. So, but enlightened veterinarians now can offer separated vaccine components. You don't have to give the quotes combo wombo. Since published data show more adverse reactions when multiple vaccines are administered together. In fact, you know, in human medicine, uh, Judy, they've even said maybe um, physicians should be giving children all the vaccines in one lump like veterinarians do. And we go, huh? Oh, Please, my gosh. That's backwards. <laughs> so, you know, one of my miniature horses somehow managed to roll and get a fence staple in his shoulder. I don't, I don't even know where he found it, but he did. And so when the veterinarian came and sedated him and yanked it out of there, she said, well, when's his last tetanus vaccine? And I'm like, I don't know, because <laughs> I don't vaccinate my animals very often. And she said, okay, well, we should give him one. And I'm like, yeah, he just had a staple pulled out of his shoulder. I probably, you know, it was deep in yeah, there. Yeah, just in case, right. And I said, okay, we can give him a tetanus vaccine. She goes, well, I only have a seven in one. And I'm like, really? I have to give him seven vaccinations because he's got a staple in his shoulder? So he got a seven in one because that was the only way I could get a tetanus vaccine. So yes, uh, we we need to be doing things differently. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at the next slide. 
So what are the key points that we should remember about vaccine issues? And this is really important. Modern vaccine technology for people and animals has afforded effective protection of companion animals and people against serious infectious diseases. However, this advancement brings an increased risk of adverse reactions, and we call those vaccinosis. Some reactions are serious, some are chronically debilitating, and some can even be fatal. However, we have to balance the benefit-risk equation, and you know that we normally talk about the risk-benefit equation, but this has been reversed because appropriate vaccination has more benefit than risk. And as Dr. Schultz said, be wise and immunize, but immunize wisely. It's wonderful. Yeah, I get, I get upset when people call me an anti-vaxxer because I'm like, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I went to veterinary school in the early 1980s when Parvo was just hitting. Right. And I mean, our we had ICU wards loaded with Parvo dogs and there was not a vaccine available. Right. And then we started using a cat vaccine to get started. And it, you know, that was one of those things. We don't see Parvo near as much as we used to. When I opened my clinic in Clayton, New Jersey, which is a very small town and not a very wealthy town, there were a lot of animals who the only veterinary care they ever got was the free rabies clinic that came around once a year, which I ended up starting doing. That was horrible. Uh, but we saw especially Rottweilers, mostly Rottweilers. And your who never and Dobermans. And never had any vaccines. And I mean, litter after litter after litter coming in with animals with Parvo. And after we were there and started educating people and we started getting some Parvo vaccines on board, we stopped seeing it. It it became a a non-problem within a couple of years of getting the community educated. So um, this is where we look at that benefit risk equation. Like, where do you live? What breed do you have? What What's their exposure? Sure. So, right. You know, one of the Next. things that's really frustrating is we still talk about colloquially feline distemper and panicopenia virus is actually a parvovirus. Right. You know, that's amazing. So um, let's look at the benefits of vaccines. So more lives have been saved, more animal production has been safeguarded than any other medical advance in human or veterinary medicine. We've eradicated smallpox and nearly all polio and measles in people, although you probably have read that older people now in some parts of the country have been getting low doses of infectious polio. Some um, really, yeah, elderly people now because their vaccines protection somehow with their immunological problems of aging may have waned. The first Hmm. vaccines were against smallpox, anthrax, and canine distemper, even though they didn't know what it was. This was many, many, many years ago. We've significantly reduced the endemics of canine distemper, canine hepatitis, and parvovirus, but not in wildlife reservoirs. So when wildlife comes towards urban areas, as the people are moving out to the suburbs, we have the wildlife now being exposed to potentially what's going on with the companion animals. We significantly reduce endemic feline panleukopenia, which again is a parvovirus. We've eliminated rabies in Europe. We've eradicated rinderpest in Africa and foot and mouth disease in Europe. And we still have some foot and mouth disease in North America. Not a lot, but some. Uh, Judy, before we look at the, yes, before we go to this next slide, just leave it there. Let's talk about something that came out in Pulse magazine, which is the magazine of the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association, which has 5,600 members. It's the largest group of veterinarians in the state of California. So the December, 2023 issue, talked about vaccine vacillation, (laughs) not vaccine hesitancy, like we talked about. And it's supposed to be a COVID vaccination spillover effect. Now, what they said, and they looked at 2,200 U.S. dog owners between March 30th and April 10th this year. 40% of dog owners, this was published in Vaccine, by the way, by a a professor from the Boston University School of Public Health. 40% of dog owners believe that canine vaccines are unsafe. 
More than 20% of dog owners believe canine vaccines are ineffective. 30% think canines' vaccines are medically unnecessary. And about 37% of dog owners believe canine vaccines could cause dogs to develop autism. Remember that whole issue about vaccinations? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So what is it? Lack of confidence, according to Richard Ford, and complacency. 36% of respondents in 2022, last year, distrusted big pharma. So when you look at these observations from the article just published in Vaccine, it's pretty scary, frankly, that that many people believe that vaccines are unsafe or that they're ineffective and that they're medically unnecessary. Never mind the fact that this whole business about autism has since been disproven. <laughs> um, but what can you say? So I think the word vaccine vacillation is an interesting way to put it. Yeah, I hadn't heard that one. I have heard the uh, vaccine hesitancy. And I just read a couple of veterinary articles right. talking about that. Uh, so it probably came from this same information. But, um, you know, it it is a problem. And, you know, people like me with holistic platforms, I speak out all the time against over vaccination and irresponsible vaccination. And I think that unfortunately, a lot of times that gets translated into we should never give a vaccine right. um, or that they are always going to be harmful. And that is not the case, right. but we have to be very judicious about it. I think the term vac vacillation is interesting, though, because that gives us an entree to educate better. Mm -hmm. If there were hesitancy is one thing. Vacillation means they aren't sure. They're confused. Right. So it's our job. Um, working with, uh, you know, conventional practice, being traditional practices as we are, um, we need to educate better. So let's look at what is, what is this memory cell immunity as shown here? Memory cells are created when B and T lymphocytes in the body respond to an immune stimulus. These cells then replicate when responding to any kind of invading antigen. They form clones that retain information about each prior exposure and therefore generate immune memory. So we have to remember is that as soon as we enter the world, in fact, we even have it as a fetus, when we enter the world, we start seeing immune responses and we react to them and these are memories. The immune system then mounts a faster and more powerful anamnestic response immediately when it encounters the same antigen again with viral exposures, vaccines, bacteria, fungi, parasites, you name it. So the immune system capacity for memory generates immunity through vaccines, but it can also trigger adverse events like autoimmune disorders, allergies, and hypersensitivities. So actually what we're talking about today is how do vaccines work? And I thought this was interesting because it comes from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC. Vaccines are biological preparations that help the body defend itself from disease without causing a full-blown infection or malignancy. The resulting protection can last a long time and even a lifetime. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Vaccines work by imitating an infection from a disease-causing organism by engaging the body's natural defenses. The active ingredient in all vaccines is an antigen. And an antigen is any substance that causes the immune system to begin producing antibodies. I thought that was an interesting, very general, but important statement. Antigens mm -hmm. can be weakened or killed bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, bits of their exterior surface or genetic material, like subunit vaccines, or non-toxic bacterial toxins. So... Vaccines can be prophylactic. In other words, they're used to prevent or alleviate the effects of a future infection by a natural or wild pathogen. In other words, exposing to the agent in the environment. Or they can be therapeutic to fight a disease that has already occurred, such as cancers. So that would be our melanoma vaccine. Right, like the melanoma vaccines, correct. Some vaccines offer full sterilizing immunity. And that's important because it means that infection is prevented completely, 
Individuals that are truly immunized again and have sterile immunity can no longer be infected. And that's really important. The immune system recognizes vaccine antigens as foreign, destroys them, and then remembers them because it creates the immune memory we talked about a minute ago. So vaccine types can be attenuated. That's live. They're live, but they've been produced in a, a much lower pathogenic sense. They're inactivated or killed, like rabies vaccine, for example. They can be a toxoid. They can be a subunit vaccine. They can be a conjugated vaccine. They can be outer membrane vesicle vaccines. They can be heterotypic. In other words, they look at several different things of different backgrounds. They can be a gen genetic. They can be a viral vector va vaccine. They can be mRNA and DNA or products under experimental development that are secret. We don't know what they are yet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at sterilizing immunity. Sterilizing immunity is an immune response that completely prevents and eliminates an infection. Animals or people properly immunized against the clinically important viral diseases have sterilizing immunity that not only prevents clinical disease, but prevents infections. And only the presence of antibody can prevent infection. So an animal with a positive serum antibody test, which we often call vaccine titer immunity, is protected from infection. And that's really important. So those individuals that have animals that have a positive serum antibody test do not need to be vaccinated against for that particular agent. And that's where your clinical veterinarian may be confused because they may not understand that that means they're protected. Yeah. Vaccinating that animal would not cause a significant increase in antibody titer. It can cause a little blip, an increase for a few weeks, and it goes back down to the baseline wherever it is. Hypersensitivity to the vaccine components can develop. For example, fetal bovine serum or eggs that are in vaccines yeah. and all the proprietary excipients that they don't tell you about. Furthermore, the animal doesn't need to be revaccinated and should not be revaccinated since the vaccine could cause an adverse hypersensitivity reaction. Now, this gets into, you know, those gray areas, and I, you might have a, a, a clearer answer for us, but is any tighter considered a protective titer because a lot of times you'll get back and it'll say, Oh, it's one, anything less than one to 80 is not protective. So if they have any detectable antibody, are they protected or do we need a certain level? Okay. One to 80 is the um, cutoff that many uh, companies, uh, you know, uh, that measure this say for parvovirus for distemper, it's one to 16. This is whole nonsense. Okay. The point is, it should be <laughs> clearly measurable. So it's going to have to be maybe above one to four, one to five, for example. You know, I'm just using that as an example. And their serial dilutions are done. And, you know, we have uh, veterinarians that want to tighter the antibody level when it's 3,000 out serially. Well, nobody can afford to do that because the lab has to use a set of reagents every time they do a new dilution. So obviously, it's going to be prohibitively expensive. So when you get to a certain cutoff point, you don't need a higher titer. So having more isn't better. <laughs> so 1 to 16 for distemper and 1 to 80 for parvo is usually what they call, um, you know, the threshold levels. Now, the problem with the distemper one is that if the veterinarian does not order a vaccine serum antibody titer test, the company that's measuring it will think that the animal has clinical distemper and they will start the dilution of the patient's serum at one to 20. So they're going to miss the vaccine titer at one to 16 or one to eight or one to four. So we get huh. clients whose veterinarian doesn't understand that they didn't order the right version of the test. Okay. Um, and they think the animal's not protected. So they want to revaccinate for distemper. And like you found out, they don't carry a single distemper vaccine. Of course not. They have the combo wombo. So the animal gets a combination booster because they think that this 
distemper titer wasn't adequate, when in fact it wasn't titered at the vaccine level, it was titered at the disease level. Now, not all vaccines produce sterilizing immunity. Those that do would be canine distemper virus, canine adenovirus, which we use to cross-protect against hepatitis, and canine parvovirus in the dog, and panleukopenia virus, which is a parvovirus, in the cat. Examples that produce of vaccines that produce non-sterile immunity would be leptospirosis, Bordetella, canine influenza, rabies, and herpes virus and Khaleesi virus, the upper respiratory viruses of cats. Now, while non-sterile immunity may not protect the animal from infection, it would keep the protection from progressing to severe clinical disease. Remember, the act of vaccination may not equate to immunization. Because it doesn't matter how many times an animal or a person's been vaccinated. If their immune system didn't respond, they're not immunized. So they're not protected. So I know we use the terms interchangeably, but we need to explain to our clients that you need to prove they're immunized. And we do that by measuring serum antibody titers at least three weeks after the vaccination and at least after 16 weeks of age. Because if you measure it before that, you'll get some residual maternal immunity potentially being measured. And that gives a false sense of security. Did you want to say something, Kennedy? Well, yeah. I mean, so we know that we can run the titers for distemper, parvo, rabies, hepatitis, panluke. Um, so what about all the non-sterilizing? Oh, immunity? you can clearly measure leptospirosis. Now, remember, there's 22 different serovars of leptospirosis, but <laughs> only seven are clinically important. But the current vaccines only contain four. So the way to right. do it for lepto is to uh, people that want to know is to measure the serum seven serovars immunities. And if they all come out low, that means the animal hasn't been exposed and hasn't been vaccinated. Okay, because sometimes you get a risk. Or, well, it may have been vaccinated, but it didn't. It didn't. Build an it didn't response. get immunized, right? So a lot of animals from shelters right. they don't know what the vaccine history is, for example. So they'll do that to, to try to determine whether they want to vaccinate or not vaccinate these pets that are already stressed and can be malnourished and parasitized and, God forbid, right? right? Sadly. Right. So, but we don't have titers that we routinely use for Lyme or Bordetella. Sure or we do. Sure we do. Lyme vaccine titers are pretty easy to do. Um, and you can do the, remember the C6 uh, antibody for Lyme. Uh, for Bordetella. So would that come, if a C6, this is a, this is a sure. good question. Uh, so if a dog had been immunized for mm -hmm. Lyme, would their C6 come it should up be. high? Mm -hmm. It usually is. Now, sometimes they're so not. Mean... Sometimes they're not. But if the animal's not sick, we don't okay. do anything about it. Right. But so because I have seen many animals that are vaccinated for Lyme and then they still come up with Lyme disease symptoms and a Lyme disease diagnosis. Right. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy about what the diagnosis is. There's a whole drop down menu about if they're not sick and it's positive, you ignore it. If it's over 30 on the C6, for example, and the animal's not sick, you don't okay. do anything. Okay. Now, Perfect. Good. Then I've been saying the right thing, but. <laughs> right. No, no. Well, Bordetella, there is a, a vaccine titer for Bordetella, but it's basically useless. So don't spend any right. money doing right. that because it's a weak antigen. So you're going to get titers of one to four, one to eight. We don't know what they mean. So just forget it. And remember Bordetella, not the injectable ever, only the right. oral right. Pref pre yeah. preferred. And there's the new oral vaccine that comes with um, parainfluenza together. Have you seen that one? Uh, it's I the, may it's have. It's a brand before, new vaccine that's being advertised everywhere. I won't name the company. Uh, oral Bordetella plus parainfluenza in an, a syringe you put in the mouth. Now, you know, nobody really knows what parainfluenza does clinically, actually. But but <laughs> having it isn't a bad idea, you know, together. I don't I don't have that as a bad idea, especially if it's oral, right? The late Professor Michael Day, who left this world far too early, what a wonderful man. 
In the 2015 to 2017 World Small Animal Veterinary Association, what he said was, vaccination should be just one part of a holistic preventive healthcare program for pets. It is most simply delivered within the framework of an annual health check consultation. He then said that vaccination is an act of veterinary science that should be considered as individualized medicine, tailored for the needs of the individual pet and delivered as part of a preventive medicine program in an annual health check visit. That's wonderful, isn't it? It is. And, you know, it goes so against what we're seeing with vaccines, like I, all these big box stores that you walk into and they have the vet clinic there that week, you know, every Wednesday from five to seven, come in, get in line and get your 37 vaccinations all at once. There's no exam involved. There's no medical history. There's, there's no, you know, when did he last have his vaccines? It's just, and yeah, and then, and you know, it's like we've got to educate people on both sides of the fence. We've got those who are vaccine vacillators, vaccine hesitant, uh, think all vaccines are bad, and then we've got the other side of the fence where it's like, hey, they've got a new vaccine. Let me be the first one in line to go right. get it, and. I think, you know, I, I think the veterinary profession is shooting itself in the foot with the low cost vaccine clinics and the, you know, everybody All just bring stuff. your pet and get. And you know, in the vaccine yeah, clinics, it's just... Judy, they use the vaccines that have mercury in them. When when the same company makes one without mercury because it's more expensive. Right. So when they do the vaccine clinic, they're going to use the cheaper vaccine and give them all heavy metal poisoning. So what's an adjuvant? An adjuvant is something put into a vaccine to accelerate, prolong, or enhance antigen-specific immune responses. And remember, as we've discussed, antigens can be all kinds of things. They're added into vaccines to enhance the immunogenicity, the ability of the vaccine to stimulate an immune response. But this increases the risk of autoimmune and inflammatory adverse events. Now, this is so frightening. Killed and activated vaccines containing adjuvants make up 15% of veterinary biologics, but they're associated with 85% of post vaccinal reactions. That's very scary. Uh -huh. And rabies, of course, is one of those. Adjuvants have been used safely uh -huh. in human veterinary medicine for decades. But there is increasing worldwide concern about the safety of using mercury and aluminum in vaccines. All right, folks, there is so much information here that we are going to split this into two days. We're going to have Jean finish this for us tomorrow because there's just so much stuff. Uh, so... We're going to take a break tomorrow. We'll see you back. We're going to finish this conversation and you will be well-educated on how vaccines work. Mm -hmm.